So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, May 20th, and this is Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers, episode number 160. My name is Frederick Dunn, and this is the way to be. So anyway, it's going to get to the 80s today, so above 27 degrees Celsius. And uh, that's just about it. We had a cold start to the morning, raining again, which has set the bees back. But I hope that you guys are ready. If you live in my part of the country and the weather warms up and the sun shines, if you're going to have swarms, it's going to happen now, very soon. So I hope you're ready for all of that. And if you want to know what we're going to talk about today, please look down in the video description below. If you want to leave a comment, please comment in the comments section. If you want to try to keep track of all these episodes of Backyard Beekeeping, please click the thumbs up button there so that you'll know that you've watched it and maybe it was above average for you. So I think that's about it for now. There'll be other links and beneficial information down in the video description as well. So thanks for being here as always. Let's start right off with a question from Wood Kokla. And real name is Brian here. Yesterday, while inspecting a hive, we were being buzzed by carpenter bees. Then we realized why. They've bored into the outside corner of the hive and uh, that we were inspecting. And then we closed off the hole with wax to see what happens. Regards, Brian. Okay, so here's the thing that fell right into my lap because I'm already dealing with carpenter bees right now. As you may know, if you looked at last week's episode or maybe it was a week before even, we put up the Way to Be Academy building and it has unprotected wood. Heavy posts. So by heavy posts, I mean four by fours or thicker. And carpenter bees are hatching out and they're buzzing all over the place. Now the carpenter bees that you run into that usually are the most conspicuous are those that are guarding the nests for the females and those are the males. And they have yellow squares right on their face. That's how you can tell. And just like honeybees, they can't sting, but they can bite if you grab them. So we think about trapping them out because uh, it's true. They'll chew your bee boxes. Now it's also true that they tend to chew on boxes or wood that's unprotected. So raw lumber that's thicker is generally the target. So when it comes to beehive boxes, most of those are three quarters of an inch thick. And uh, I had one last year, Carpenter Bee chewed right into the side of the box and created an extra entrance on the upper box. It was an old super that had the paint peeling off. So there again, it wasn't protected. So if you're trying to keep the Carpenter Bees out of your beehives and out of your boxes, um, you wanna have a good finish on them. One of the things I noticed was they have not been chewing into the eco wood treated boxes. So that seems safe because I thought maybe they would chew into that because it seems kind of benign. But I want to talk a little bit about trapping carpenter bees. If you've got out buildings, because a lot of uh, beekeepers have sheds and buildings and old barns and things like that, and the carpenter bees are buzzing all over the place. I've had chicken coops that are chewed up like Swiss cheese by carpenter bees. So in the past, I got into setting up traps for them. And I'm going to give you some options. So in the cover image today I was holding up two traps for those of you who don't like to make things this is a carpenter bee trap that I bought I bought uh, eight of these as a matter of fact and they have this plastic capsule in the bottom which comes in the package all closed up in here in fact this is what the package looks like they're called best bee traps so if you don't like to make things don't want to drill holes you want something ready to go this is a good choice and you hang it uh, under the eaves in the soffit area. In fact, wherever you see uh, examples of the bees chewing holes are ready, that would be a good place to put one of these. Now, how well do they work? Because that was the other part. I've been testing these for the last several weeks. They come with a string to hang them up. I don't like that idea because who wants to just hang it from a string? When you have holes on the back here that can secure it where we are, we get wind, storms, and rain, and everything else. So I wanted it to be a little more secure than that. You can't open the top. You can't get into it. Once it's set up, it's set up. Although, the bottom has a trap door here. But I'm going to talk a little bit about the bees. How do you get them to go to this? They naturally explore these holes. Fred, what's the diameter of the hole? Roughly half an inch. So the bees... Uh, 
snoop around and they go up in there but what's their incentive to check this particular box out other than the fact that there's a hole and they will check out holes that exist first they go inside and then once they're inside because of the angle of the hole they see light down here they go into this capsule and there they're stuck and the bottom of that capsule is vented so he's got the little holes in here and that venting is not uh, to keep the bee alive it's to attract other bees with pheromones through that jar so when you want to let them out, you flip this down and they'll come out. They also include a big long cord with it. So you could have this way up somewhere. And once it's starting to fill up with bees, you can pull the cord and dump it out. But guess what? I don't dump them out at all. And at first I thought they weren't working very well. And then I looked at them uh, just a few minutes before I came in to do this. And uh, they have bees in them. Another way that you can prime them, and this is bait for any trap that you're using, not just one that you might buy at the store, or in this case, this one was from Amazon. Um, leave dead bees in them. Just like honeybees, they're pheromone based. Male bees are seeking out female bees. So one of the things that you can do to prime the trap is you can go out there with a butterfly net. Now, if you're a beekeeper and you don't own a really good butterfly net, I highly suggest that you get some. I use them for a lot of different things, but what the butterfly net did for me is I can catch the guard bees. So the guard bees, when it comes to carpenter bees, would be the males, the ones with the yellow patch on the face. They hover right at eye level and they get really intense and it works. It scares people off. You'll even see them chasing off honeybees and other carpenter bees. They're in competition for the female. So you can catch one with your butterfly net. So this habit they have of defending the nest, defending their territory and the buildings that they're occupying makes them easy to catch. So use your butterfly net, catch one, and then you can put that in the freezer, whatever you want to do to kill the bee, and then just open up the bottom of this, drop your bee in there, and now you've got bait for your hive. But let's say you don't want to buy one, you want to build one. Because the ones that I've built through the years have worked extremely well. Same thing, I put them under the soffits. This is just four by four pressure treated stock, although probably if you could find untreated wood, that might even work better. But if you're worried about it, pressure treated lumber, the bees still chew into it, so they don't seem to matter. And I wrote uh, the dimensions on the side here. So the holes that go in half inch, I put two of them in the corner and they're offset. Sometimes you'll see people center the holes on these. If you notice this hole is not centered, and that hole is seven eighths of an inch. So you can use a spade bit or something like that if you wanna drill that center hole up. So what I do first is I drill the center hole in as deep as the bit will go. Deeper probably the better, but you don't wanna go out through the top on it. And then what I do is I come in straight at the side and then I angle it and go up because the goal is if you look at the hole from the side, you shouldn't be able to be in that central column and see daylight out there. Because then what the bees do is they look through the hole, the riser in the middle, they see light in this jar down here, and they follow the light, just like honeybees do. That's why honeybees collect all over your windows. Once they're inside the house or inside your bee building or whatever. The other thing is, notice this one, the jar is glued in place. So, I don't have a vented jar. Like these other capsules have vents in them to put the pheromone of the bees out to attract others. That might work. I mean, I don't know if it works better because uh, now the only place with this jar that pheromone is coming out is through these holes and that gets the bees in there. I've got jars on my bee shed that are two thirds full with carpenter bees. So I don't empty them. I just leave them there year after year and bees still come to them. So it doesn't ruin it. Then whenever you're through, these are just old jelly jars that you get and that's it. Four by four block jelly jars and then where do you put them i found for me the ones that get visited first by the carpenter bees the one that chews is the female by the way and uh, they went to the northeast corner under the soffit first so again your indicator is where they've been chewing before and that's the other part of this but anything out of the weather shelter they tend to go to that first and uh what was I going to say? The other end of it is um, 
what to do to seal up the holes. So here's what I do for holes. And it's important at the end of the year, because when are they active? They're going to be active right through summer. So they're drilling holes, but see what happens is the female is going in 90 degrees to the grain. So she cuts in through the face of whatever board it happens to be. Hopefully it's not a beehive. And then she goes parallel with the grain and she runs longitudinal, parallel to the edges. And then she makes a bunch of chambers. So once she's drilled her hole in there, she lays an egg, she provisions it, and then she seals that off. Then she lays another egg, she provisions it, and she seals it off. And they don't overwinter that way. So what happens is later on, near the end of the summer, the next generation hatches out again. So you're going to need to have your traps ready to go to get those carpenter bees that are coming out. And then, of course, they'll winter over. And then in the spring, the cycle starts all over again. And it is amazing the amount of damage they can do to the wood beneath the surface that you may not even be aware of. So I use uh, Type Bond 3 wood glue, mix it up with um, sanding dust, or if you've got some kind of skill saw, or if you've got a chop saw or a miter saw or something like that, mix it all up, make your own wood putty out of that, because Type Bond 3, instead of 1 and 2, has a much longer working time, so it'll stay putty-like for a long time. Mix up a bunch of that and then push it with your finger right into those holes and then plug them up. So otherwise they go to holes that are existing first, which is why traps like this kind of work. Does this work better than this? No, not really. All these probably look tidier if you're into the appearance, the optics of things. You want something that can just hang against the wall from attack or whatever. This is probably better for that. These you will have to generally put a hook in the top so you can hook it up there but I just drill a hole through one of the corners and put a wood screw through and hold it right there. The other part is when you're looking at the building at the soffit I found out that like let's say this is the piece of wood that goes up against if this clear part hangs free of the structure and you can see light from it I found that that will attract bees so maybe they're attracted to bees in the traps visually as well as pheromone wise. So I did notice that those that had exposed capsules or jars uh, got bee attention quicker, but occupied, that's it for that. So I know that's much more of an answer probably than was being sought, but since I happen to be doing it and I'll be posing a video about carpenter bees later on, not later on today, but after several weeks of testing. We'll have more and I'll show you the bees and give you explanations about their appearance, behavior, and stuff like that. So that was question number one. Next question comes from Michael. I listened to your method of better bee swarm traps. Purchased and set up two. Yesterday I now have yesterday I saw that one now has bees. Thanks for the video. You're welcome. Thanks for watching. I was going to give them a week and then move the trap 700 feet to my bee yard. I know the three foot or three mile rule, but don't have another place to use. So will the portal door keep the queen contained so the colony will not abscond and the only issue will be confused foragers? I've heard that to place a branch partially covering the entrance so foragers reorient. Does that work or should I really push to find a three mile site? Good news. And by the way, this question just came in today from Michael, so I'm giving the answer right now. That rule about three feet or three miles or two feet or two miles and all that does not apply to swarms. So that's the good news. So when your swarm trap gets occupied, I recommend that you move them right away. Don't wait seven days. They'll be settled and that becomes their new, lo their new home. So as soon as your observation hive is occupied, Move it or transition all of the frames that are in that into the frame of the box that you want in your apiary. And that apiary can be 20 feet away. It won't matter. So three feet, three miles does not apply. Transfer them as quick as possible. Keep another swarm trap there. You've got two and they're working. So that's good news. And uh, you want to keep a swarm trap in the same location to get secondary swarms. So good news all around. Good news that you caught it. The configuration worked and go ahead and put those in the box that you want right in your beehive. No, no reason to wait. Waiting is bad. And uh, putting them right in right away anywhere you want. They've already swarmed. They chose to leave the colony that they originally resided in. They're now following the queen's pheromone. If she's in there, you're gonna keep them. Make sure to put sugar syrup on there or something like that. 
so that uh, they'll be having an incentive to stay there. And that will keep them. The other question was, should you close up the queen excluder dial on that? And uh, I don't think that's necessary. You can, but I don't, you know, I've never done it myself uh, to keep a queen there from a swarm. And it's very rare for me to have a swarm abscond. So I think you're in good shape. I think you're okay for moving and everything else. Next question comes from Keith Spillman. And uh, flow is still great in the foothills of North Carolina. The supers are stacking up and I've gone from four to 12 hives and haven't bought any bees, just a lot of woodenware. As a side note, after my wife was chased away by a single honeybee while helping with my latest video, I decided the name for these single attack bees is the Terminator Bee. And then Keith goes on to explain that they never give up, they never stop, just like the Terminator, it will hunt you forever. Um, but this ties into another thing, and I'm going to put a link to the butterfly nets that I like. Every beekeeper should have a butterfly net. And uh, here's one of the reasons why. Carpenter bees, whatever. You may need to nab a bee. And most backyard apiaries, uh, at some time of year, you get just the one or two guard bees that won't leave you alone. They follow you all the way back to your garage, to your shed, to wherever. And they just won't leave you alone. You can take your butterfly net, catch that bee, park the net right on the ground, and keep her in the net until you're through working in the bee yard, and then release her again later if you want to. Because um, the one bee, there's no reason your whole inspection should be ruined by the one bee that's in your face constantly. So I highly recommend butterfly net for many reasons. Anytime you need to catch something, if you want to get a closer look at it or whatever, you decide whether you want to dispatch it or not. And uh, good news from Keith, but take out that one guard bee that's kind of out of sorts there. Next question comes from Nathaniel from Fort Scott, Kansas. Help, my bees are being robbed. At least I think they are. And by the way, several robbing questions came this week. Uh, I came out to check my bees at around 5 p.m. Friday night. I had looked at them earlier that day and uh, no problems, but this time there was a flood of bees at the entrance. This is only a month old colony from a three pound package of bees. So that's an indicator right there. Month old colony, three pound package of bees, and the bees are Saskatrass bees. So I don't expect this much activity. At the same time, I know the younger bees from the package may be turning into foragers now as the eggs began to hatch. I saw no debris on the landing board or the ground that might indicate robbing. I saw lots of bees going in, very few going out. However, there were also a few bees hanging out at the back of the hive and a large amount hanging underneath. And these are, in fact, I'm going to stop right here. That is not robbing behavior. So if you see bees collected on the front of your hive or bearding under the landing board or hanging out, on the hive, you're not being robbed. And the reason I say that is because robbers don't loiter. Robbers get what they want, they take it, they leave. They don't stick around. So robbing behavior, the debris field, that was great to look for debris on the landing board. If it's absent, that's another check on the box of not being robbed. If the bees are not going directly in and getting directly out, then, and they're just hanging out on the front, check the box, not being robbed. The indicator that sometimes they might be being inspected by robbers is when you see bees on the back of the hive checking every little joint and crevice trying to look for a backdoor entrance. The other part of this description was that there's a screened bottom board and they were collected underneath the bottom board as well. Again, not an indicator of the colony being robbed because robber bees don't want to stick around and they're not going to cling to even a screened bottom board and just cluster there. So it sounds to me like resident bees, and it sounds like you might have had a recent break in the weather as well, because after a bunch of rain and cold days like we've had here, uh, I was inspecting my bee yard yesterday, and uh, it sounded like they were swarming. But what was really going on was a flurry of activity because we just came out of cold weather, just came out of rain, and uh, now the bees are taking the opportunity to get as much done as they can, and there is a bunch of uh, evidence that they're doing 
orientation flights hanging out in front and in some cases looking for a queen to get out so i did have to do one emergency split yesterday i was going to video it but i was running tight on time so i didn't get to do that but i had a bunch of bees in the front that were just hovering and facing it they weren't doing their figure eight orientation flights which are very common for newly emerged bees workers that are out there now at their flight stage so remember we're not talking about bees that have just emerged from their cells because those aren't flyers yet. Those are nurse bees. Nurse bees go through a series of jobs. They get older, more mature, stronger, healthier, and then they move to the outside. And that's when you see the orientation flights. So everything that's described here, I think you're okay. I don't think you're being robbed. And uh, robbing bees, like I said, straight in, straight out. They don't want to play games. They don't want to fight. So here's another question right away. And this one came with photos. That's why we're going to stay on the robbing theme for a second. It says, uh, this is from Amy. So it says, I would appreciate your wisdom on these two photos. This is a thriving flow hive in its second year, and it seems to be under attack daily with bees all over the front of the hive, but also underneath. This is a pic of the core flute at the bottom of the hive, and the other is taken upwards of the bottom of the hive. Are these robbers or my own bees? There are plenty of resources in Lancaster, PA right now. So this is Lancaster, PA. So based on what I just said, and we look at this photo here, what do you think? Do those look like robbers? No, those are socializers. They're just hanging out. Now, sometimes you will see robbers come out, pause, and they will do some trophallaxis, some taste testing, because they might be coming in groups, hundreds even, from the same hive. And they're coming in to attack this hive together and they might exchange uh, what's inside the hive with each other on the landing board. But that happens briefly and they're on their way out. The other thing is bees that have robbed a hive on the inside that have gotten ill-gotten gains and they get out there on the landing board, they do the abdomen twist. You'll see them twirling their abdomens around, organizing the resources that they've gotten uh, before they take off often. And resident bees don't do that. So those are robbers on their way out. Here's the other shot here of the bees on the screen bottom board. And there again, they look, see how they're all looking in different directions. They're all pretty casual and they are in fact just hanging out. So thank you for those photos that came with the question. And I think that you're good to go. Now, what if you really wanna know? What if you're just a brand new beekeeper and you're so worried about it and they're just, they're, you think they're robbing and you can't be sure, and you think they're coming from another uh, colony in your own apiary, what can you do? You can take powdered sugar, throw it on the bees that are departing. And if you see those bees going to another apiary, another apiary, another hive in your apiary, because uh, the white powdered sugar marks them, they'll be taking that back and you can see them going on the landing boards of another hive. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna really Go out on a limb and say neither of those situations uh, describes robbing behavior. Robbers go straight in, straight out, and get away. And again, they, they ping around, but what don't they do? They don't collect, they don't dangle, they don't make beards, they don't form clusters on the hive itself. Those sound like resident bees. So I think everyone is good to go. The next question comes from Chris Jordan from Wisconsin. So my question is, so let's see, do I leave my mouse guards on my hives? Can the drones uh, be able to enter and exit the entrance? And I've bought these mouse guards online. The only reason for leaving them on is it had a lot of mice problems last summer and fall. Summer and fall mouse problems, that is so rare, by the way. The mice generally like to move into beehives in fall and winter so that they can take advantage of the warmth and the shelter and everything else that's in there. And when it comes to um, hardware cloth that's used as an excluder for mice, uh, they generally are big enough to let queens get through, drones can get through, and the workers can get through. I mean, we don't describe here what the size of that grid is, and I don't use them. So we found that uh, if you reduce your entrance, if you have an entrance reducing board that inserts underneath your main deep box, if it is only three eighths of an inch in height, that opening, uh, the mice can't get into it. 
So the other thing I'm interested in here is, and it wasn't answered, is uh, what kind of mice are they that you're catching inside the hive? Uh, what's the species? And generally, uh, because I've done my own testing on this for years and years and years, and I credit Matthias Wandel, who's got a his own YouTube channel, guy with a lot of uh, time on his hands. He acts like an MIT engineer. And... Uh, he did all the testing for the different sizes of openings, the gaps and things that mice can get through. And here where I live, we're talking about deer mice or house mice. There's nothing else around here that tries to get into hives. And the only time I found a mouse inside a beehive was in stored equipment. So what I did was we took bee boxes, landing boards, entrance reducers, closed them all up, and then put a whole bunch of uh, black oil sunflower seed inside and uh, you start off with an opening that the bees can get through, not the bees, the mice can get through to get the seeds so they know there's food there. And then uh, you continue to reduce the openings just by height, not width. So if it's three eighths inches high, even if it's four or five inches wide, the mice can't get through. Their skulls are just too big and they can't compress their skull. So even though they know there's food in there, as you reduce it, three eighths, magic number, three eighths and smaller, they can't get through. So I don't personally use these metal mouse guards. So the screens. And then your other problems are solved because a three eighths inch opening, you know, your queens can swarm, your um, drones can get in and out. And uh, of course your workers can do all of that and they have no problems removing detritus and materials from your colony. So I think uh, I would go that route, but to answer the question, we don't know the size that you're talking about of the screen that you have. But you could sit there and watch. If drones can get through, you'll see it. They'll come and go. There's always a drone scooting around somewhere. So direct observation will answer that question too. The next one comes from Joe, St. Petersburg, Florida. I have noticed that propolis or propolis, depending on how you want to pronounce it, seems to be the heaviest at the ends of the frames where we tend to hold them. Have you found this to be true? Yeah, that's an area where they seal things up pretty good. Also, from my understanding, propolis is more important than first thought. Do you think adding tree resin, say in the corner, they might use to help with the propolis envelope? Okay, so a couple of things here. Yes, it's true that it, when you look in your beehives and there's that dark brown substance, it's usually dark brown, root beer colored, and it glues everything together. And yes, where you're where your frame set in, that little corner where it sits on the rabbit joint, that tends to be propolized pretty heavily. And the bees bring it in, and it's exactly right as described here by um, resins from trees. And uh, the more of it that's in your hive, some people hate it. In fact, there are lines of bees that are known for producing and gathering a lot of propolis. So let me clear that up. I said producing pro propolis. Bees find it, they gather it, they bring it back, and then they work it into corners and seal things up. So according to Dr. Spivak, Marla Spivak, she does this research on propolis, a propolis envelope. And uh, yes, it is like the immune system for your hive. The more of it, in my opinion, that you have, the better. Science supports it. It makes your hive interior into a self-sanitizing surface, basically. So it helps with all kinds of disease control. And uh, it's how your bees protect themselves. They find little cracks and crevices and pulpy areas. They try to chew away the pulp or dried out areas and they seal it up with propolis. So the second part, so yes, if you have it, great. I never complain about it. Sometimes you'll even see it pooled on the bottom. Uh, Dr. Spivak mentioned recently that it comes in and gets uh, worked into the joints and crevices virtually unchanged by the bees. So there's some divergence of information there as well because some entomologists that study propolis uh, will say that the bees amend the propolis, that they do something to it to add to its medicinal value and uh, its antimicrobial, antibacterial value. And uh, others say that, like Dr. Spivak recently said, it, it's basically unchanged. They're finding it, they're catching it, they're, they're bringing it in on their corbicula, on their hind legs. And unlike pollen, so sometimes people will send me a picture of weird looking pollen and it's really shiny and it looks like an amber teardrop on their hind leg. Uh, it's often propolis and not pollen. And the bees can scratch off pollen into the cells themselves, but when they go in with propolis stuck on their hind legs, 
They need help from the other bees and they go right to wherever the propolis is necessary, where the cracks and crevices are that they're sealing up and other bees help them get it off and work it. Of course, the hotter it is outside, uh, the easier it is for the bees to work, but the stickier it is. And this is also why when you're working your beehives, you do it on the hottest uh, time of the day, in the afternoon sometimes, sunlight's better, you can see better. Also, everything is hotter inside the hive and the propolis is not as strong. So it doesn't like set like glue and then it's hard forever. It's soft or hard depending on whether or not it's cold or warm. <clears throat> so I would not bring in my own. I wouldn't go out there and try to find resin on trees because chances are you're going to get the wrong stuff. I mean, we can't go to a pine tree and see that there's a bunch of sap where we, you know, cut a branch off or something and then gather that sap and try to stick it in the hive and get the bees to use it. I think we're much better off letting the bees find buds of leaves that are about to open and that's where they get their resin from most trees. So salute to Dr. Marla Spivak for her research, her team's research on propolis and the propolis envelope. Uh, I wouldn't bother gathering and trying to put that in there yourself. The bees are going to find what they need when they need it. Next question comes from George from Sacramento, California. I'm a backyard beekeeper going into my second year and I started my first hive with a package of Saskatras bees. Yeah, Saskatras is selling a pile of bees. So a lot of people are talking about these. They come originally from Saskatchewan, Canada, if you want to read up on them. Anyway, uh, the package of bees was installed last April. Very quickly superseded the Saskatras queen, so they lost the queen. And uh, they made another queen and that made it through this past winter. So fast forward to two weeks ago, the colony swarmed and I caught them. Kudos for catching that swarm. The next day, I inspected and found uncapped queen cells, not cups. And I destroyed them because before they swarmed, I purchased a bee weaver queen. So now we're going from Saskatras to bee weaver. She arrived about a week after they swarmed and I introduced her on 5-11. So May 11th. And I let the bees uh, release her on Saturday the 14th. I inspected and found little to no eggs. Now that statement right there, little to no eggs. You either have a few eggs or no eggs. So if you have little eggs or a few eggs, I think you're good to go. We've just put her in there and they're getting used to her. She's laying her eggs. If she's laying eggs, I would say good to go. Let her go. Anyway, uh, it seems as though she has only laid in the queen cups and they're getting ready to swarm. Do you have any guidance or thoughts on this? I've asked my association and the ones I have spoken to have not heard of the situation. So if she's providing eggs and making queen cups. Now let's get into personally, what would I do? So we have a bee weaver queen that we bought, flew her in, installed her in the hive. <clears throat> we got rid of the queen cells. So we know that the eggs that are in the queen cells that are in the hive now are from the bee weaver queen. She might not be capable. Let's take the worst case scenario. Something happened to her in transit. She overheated. Uh, her fertility is damaged potentially and her laying capacity may be reduced. Now these are just possibles, not for sure. But so I look at my frame and I see that I've got, you know, a few eggs in there, but I know for sure they're making queen cells. So that tells us that it's coming from the queen. Workers that are laying workers can't produce replacement queens. If they did, we'd have no problems with queen loss. But they can't, so we know they're coming from the queen. So that's right, you're right on the money. And we've got queen cells being built. Now what would I do? Here's what I would do. I hope you have a nucleus hive. I would take the queen, the bee weaver queen. I would pull her out with two frames of resources and uh, drawn comb, nurse bees, stuff like that. I would leave the brood with the resident colony. I would put those two frames with that queen, the bee weaver queen, and I would put them in my nucleus box, five frame nucleus box, hopefully the wooden ones, nice and insulated and uh, set them aside as an insurance policy. Then I would let the resident 
bees there and you have to replace the frames of course that you pulled away and you move all of your other brood frames together in the center so don't checkerboard them push them all together let them make those replacement queens <clears throat> because you're going to learn a couple of things at the same time here one is the queen that's been moved into your nucleus hive with her nurse bees she can start continuing to lay and those bees can continue to take care of the queen and uh, she can very gradually build back up from a very small number of bees we're in the warm enough time of year where it's not going to be a huge challenge for them if you had one full you know frame deep frame of brood on that we're talking three or four thousand bees per side so over three thousand bees let's be conservative per side in there so she'll have enough to take care of her and then the bees that you have in the resident colony uh, when those queens hatch, um, then we'll know when they fly out, do their mating flights and everything, what their fertility levels are. And then we'll be able to make a comparison. So if she's still producing just a few eggs, low productivity, but your new replacement queen gets mated and finds a drone, you know, does all that stuff, many drones, comes back, you'll find a revitalized derivative of the bee weaver queen. So she's not going to have all the traits that the bee weaver queen had. But your new queen, uh, when she flies off, gets made and comes back, may turn out to be a prolific uh, layer of eggs and do a nice job for that colony. And then we know that we've just got a surplus colony over here with that queen, and she might be still sputtering along. So we don't lose her. We have her. If she starts laying like crazy and you're getting really good results from her all of a sudden in that nucleus hive, we can come back and recombine and we can get rid of those queen cells that are just being finished up. So, because you'll have your answer within a week or two. And that will be before a new queen emerges and flies out, gets made, and comes back and starts laying. So you do have some overlap here, or you end up with two colonies. Not bad either way. So that's what I would recommend. That's my guidance. <clears throat> keep the queen, give her her own box, enough brood to keep her going, and find out what she's really about. Next question, McCabe from Southern Illinois, the land of Lincoln. Anyway, is it possible that rather than a virgin queen making a mating flight, the drones come to her? I've noticed the last two years with a virgin queen after a split, there's one day where hundreds of drones are suddenly pouring into the hive containing the virgin queen seemingly out of nowhere and the bees are in an absolute frenzy. You can hear the buzzing from 15 feet away and countless drones are flooding in. Then it's back to normal the next day. We'd love to get your thoughts. You're not the only one to ask this question, by the way. We got some drone issues going on and people are wondering about it. But uh, regarding the mating, do the drones come to her? Well, they can come to her. Here's the thing about drones uh, and your beehives in your backyard. You may see drones that look absolutely nothing like your bees. For example, you may have really dark bees. You might have Russian bees. And all of a sudden you see a bunch of blonde, yellow, Italian-looking drones coming in. And that's because drones go to any hive they feel like going to. And it's weird because they also tend to cluster or join colonies that don't reject them. So, and by join the colony, I mean they get in there and they invite themselves to dinner. They go to the brood area and they beg your nurse bees to feed them. That's what they do. And you can have a lot of drones. Now, are they there because of the queen? I think that's unlikely. Um, although, you know, drones are attracted at the drone congregation areas to the queen's mandibular pheromone, and uh, they're going to be drawn to the queen's sex pheromones as well. And that's how they know she's virgin or not, related or not. And so these unrelated drones are most attracted to your virgin queens. Now, I don't know for sure that they're not following her. In other words, uh, sometimes uh, if you put that pheromone high enough in the air, you can attract drones. So they're attracted by the scent. Now, would they mate with her inside the hive? Mm hmm. That's a no. So they mate on the wing, and I tried to find uh, more research on that to see if any evidence exists or has been observed or documented where drones have been attracted to a virgin queen and managed to mate with her without flight. 
and uh, that has not uh, been shown to happen. So let's move on because I think the other question is coming up. Next question comes from Dave, and it doesn't say where Dave is from. <clears throat> First is, thank you for thoughts on protective gear. I'm so grateful. I took your advice on buying the Guardian full suit. So by Guardian, that's Guardian B Apparel. I have one over here, nice vended suit, zippered front, top quality, American made, American company. I did not wear it when I transferred my B package since I just let them walk in and did not dump. I have not worn it when filling the internal feeder, just a veil and gloves with a little smoke, but I did wear it today when I removed the queen cage and I'm so glad I did as a new beekeeper and not accustomed to disturbed and angry bees buzzing all about me. It was an enormous relief knowing I was invulnerable and could focus on the task. I pick up my bee weaver package of bees on the 6th of May. They appear to be doing well, and I've started them in a 7-frame lay-ins hive with natural wax foundation on every frame. Yes, I'm a Dr. Leo fan as well. And plan to transfer them to a 14-frame maybe later this year. So my question on that is, if we have the lay-ins hive, it handles more than 14 frames. So why did we have one with a 7-frame that has to be transferred to a 14-frame Follower board adjusts the size, so I'm not sure what the configuration is. You should just have to add frames and expand it out with your follower board. But anyway, I've avoided disturbing them beyond feeding, but today I opened the hive to remove the queen cage. The cage was open and empty, showing she was released, and from what I can see from my very limited inspection, they have started building out all frames and have even started storing honey after only 10 days. I did not check for brood, but given the build out and fairly calm disposition of the bees, things look good. And this leads to my question. I've been filling an internal two quart feeder every day with one to one sugar syrup mixed with Hive Alive. This is Hive Alive. So anyway, how long would you recommend it continue feeding? When will I know when it's okay to cease? Well, it sounds to me that uh, they're already storing, you know, honey in the cells. They're already building a surplus. So I would say, although that can go away pretty darn fast if we get a bunch of bad weather, but look where we're at. We're heading into the last couple of weeks of May. And uh, for me, um, a brand new colony, this is a package, I believe. So... You could leave it on a little while because the, the thought line there is as I start to find more and more resources out in the environment, you'll see them consuming less and less of the sugar syrup and then you can just back off on that altogether. And I want to be clear that I only feed colonies that are swarm captures, package bees. That's it. Even my splits, I don't... Uh, put syrup on when I make a split. So whenever the nectar flow is coming in good with other colonies and you see lots of resources coming in from your foragers, I would just stop feeding. But being that it's a brand new, they're going through a lot and it explains why they're drawing out so much and storing some. Uh, because we know that we feed, if we have a colony that's in true jeopardy, they feed uh, two to one sugar syrup at the end of the year to try to get them built up. But, uh, <clears throat> and that's when they start storing it, but technically they could store any level. So one to one could be ending up as part of their storage in their uh, honey stores. So you can wait till they back off a little bit or as long as resource is good and the forecast is good, you can probably quit now. Just let them finish up what they have and go from there. Next question comes from Michael from East Helena, Montana. This is my first year keeping bees and I acquired two active hives in the fall and one didn't make it. My real question is about the one that did. From doing my first complete hive inspection, it appears that their previous keeper introduced the bees to a double deep hive from the get-go. I say this because there are three to four frames that are hardly drawn out in the bottom box. Most of what is in the top box seems fully drawn 
or at least nearly there. Would you consider moving the undrawn frames from the bottom to the top and some of the fully drawn from the top to the bottom? So I have other questions for Michael here. Is there a top vent? Is there an upper entrance? If there are not, if there's no top vent, and if there's no upper entrance, then I can move on to getting your brood away from the top of the hive going into the air. But the other thing is with a double deep like this, uh, it's why I always say, especially when people are setting up a new beehive system, when they buy the whole kit, they get you know two deeps, a couple of mediums, all of it's together. And then a lot of people that are brand new to beekeeping think, I'm just going to put this all together right now. I'm going to put all the boxes together, have all the room they need, and the bees are just going to use the space. So that's where the bees end up in the top box because they build down from the top. That's what they do. That's why I always suggest that you keep your bees in your deep box, your first box on the bottom board, and then with your inner cover on that and your outer cover on that until the bees have built out eight out of the 10 frames and then add the next box up. If we had done that, in this case, we would have had drawn comb everywhere in the box down below. But now we don't have that, so I only said that for those of you who are setting up hives for the first time. So now what we have uh, is fully drawn comb up above, and I suggest, uh, I personally would not change it. And uh, I would eliminate upper vent and close any upper entrance. Then the bees will eventually, as summer kicks in, spring kicks in, in a meaningful way, they will very gradually fill those upper areas with honey and resources and very gradually migrate down in the bottom. Now, if you're totally impatient, it's probably not going to ruin your bees. In this case, you could do, since it's a deep over a deep, you could do the rotation. So you could take the entire top box, put it on the bottom, and take the entire bottom box and put it on top. I'm not a fan of that, personally, but the situation we have is the bottom box was not filled out before we went to super it. So now, kind of the fastest way and the, most, the least disruptive way for your bees would be just to exchange those two boxes rather than trying to move individual frames down. Either way, you're disrupting potential brood between the two, but I think rotating boxes in this case is probably the best resolution, and I hope you'll keep us updated. <clears throat> Next question, Joel, Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. A couple of weeks ago, I had a hive swarm. Upon inspecting it, I found 8 to 10 capped queen cells, and I split the hive into a nuke uh, to be used as a resource hive, taking about half the queen cells, including three frames with brood and bees. Hmm. Okay. Yesterday, I inspected both and found a beautiful queen in the nuke, along with young larvae. However, when I inspected the parent hive, I saw the queen cells were empty, but found no evidence of a mated queen. I placed a strip of QMP into the hive to prevent laying workers. Now I have to decide whether to order a queen for the hive or pull resources from the nucleus hive back to the parent colony. If I put them back together, how do I introduce the, the nuke's queen to the parent hive? Do I put her into the queen cage to prevent the parent hive bees from killing her or just merge all the frames back? Thanks for your thoughts. Okay, this is a really easy one. Keep in mind that you're not talking about introducing your queen from your nucleus resource hive into this other hive um, to an unknown genetic line of bees. So in other words, the bees that we're talking about putting the queen back with are from the queen. So... They're genetically similar. They've all got the same heritage, so to speak, the same genetics. And uh, I personally would not have a problem at all just taking frames of brood with the queen and putting her right back in that hive together and not even doing the, the paper combination method and things like that. You're going to find that uh, when she comes with all of her pheromones and she's a queen and she's laying and everything else and these guys are queenless over here and they've not produced a... Um, you know, another mated queen yet, and now they've lost their resources to have that ability. Combining them is very easy, and you're going to find that they will accept her probably very well. 
So there's no reason to put her in a queen cage or any of that, in my opinion, because I've done this before, even with uh, hives in the same apiary, but uh, where we were doing inspection, found them to be queenless. We know that they're queenless for less than three weeks and there are no eggs, no evidence of laying workers. That's important. And so we just pulled frames uh, of brood and a queen and put them right in there and got them right back in business. So I think you're gonna find that that will work easily. Just I would just pull the frames with the queen, put her right in there. And you have to make room for her, of course, because of that saying. <clears throat> Next question comes from John, McLeansboro, Illinois. I always believe there's no such thing as a dumb question, but a couple of years ago, on a hive that swarmed a week or two earlier, I noticed worker bees carrying out a drone. I picked him up and he was clearly dying. I noticed it looked as though his junk was pulled out of his bottom. Question number one. Could the queen have been mated inside the hive? What reminded me of this is a couple of weeks ago, I caught a secondary cast swarm, primary swarm previously, and the swarm landed 50 feet away from the tree on a bench. After moving them into my plastic tote, I like to pull them away from the area to allow the rest of the bees to migrate to the opening on the lid. It was taking longer than normal for them to migrate to the tote, and I noticed then that there were a lot more drones than normal in the swarm, and that a lot of the worker bees were biting and pulling on them to keep them away from the entrance. I finished collecting the swarm and saw there were about 40 drones. Still collecting where the queen was on the bench. Question number two, can a DCA be on the ground or at least could they collect on a swarm with virgin queens? <clears throat> they can collect, they can join, they can hang out. It is very common to find a lot of drones on swarms when they're clustered in their bivouac location. So that includes on the ground for whatever reason the queen landed there. But you do find often a lot of other drones. Now they can't mate with the, I did my research on this because I wanted to make sure I'm giving a good answer here. Um, so a damaged drone, by the way, the workers inside a hive don't care about drones. Uh, if they decide to get rid of a drone and a drone's not getting the message, they will kill the drone and they will do terrible things to it. So as to why uh, the drone was damaged, its reproductive organs were damaged, I don't know, uh, but uh, bees will even spend their time stinging a drone to death if it's not getting the message. And uh, the numbers of drones, not that, not that high really either. How many drones could you expect to find in a beehive? A full-on, full productive hive could have 20% of its population represented in drones. That's a lot. So it's, you know, it can be alarming to see all kinds of drones everywhere, but uh, this time of year, not that rare. So is it natural that drones would attract and uh, collect on swarms and clusters of bees? Sure, they depend on bees for everything. They absolutely can't take care of themselves. And even when the workers are repelling them, you see drones make effort after effort to gain entry. So, they have to go to the congregation area. They have to be on the wing to mate. They, uh, they may be attracted to bees anywhere just because they depend on them for food. And it seems like whichever colony rejects them the least gets the most of them. And of course, colonies produce their own drones as well. The queen lays eggs in drone cells and produces drones. So some are residents and some are just from other, a other colonies around and they just happen to join your apiary. So. Hope that helps. This one is from Russell Reigns. That's the YouTube channel name. <clears throat> Fred, question. Scorpion, pseudos, and sphagnum moss in the bottom of your hive to fight Varroa. Your thoughts. Okay, so by the way, scorpion pseudos. Uh, pseudoscorpions, are, they have other names too, but that's something that I've spent a lot of time observing, videoing, photographing, documenting, macro and micro work. And uh, it's true that they can eat Varroa destructor mites. Yay! So everybody goes, let's get a bunch of those pseudoscorpions and turn them loose in the beehive and let them resolve our mite issue. I mean, that would be kind of cool if they would hunt out the mites and kill them. But where I found them, and because I needed to photograph and document them and make my videos, and they do feed on Varroa destructor mites. There's no question that they do. So 
Uh, that's been well proven and uh, the studies have been done and they've been published. So what happens is people immediately think, well, if they eat the Baroa destructor mite, then couldn't we get these pseudoscorpions in there and uh, turn them loose in the beehive and have them feed on all the Baroa destructor mites and solve our problem? The bees don't put up with them. So the bees run them out and that's why they exist on the bottom board and they exist in trays and in my case, the trays on the observation hives and the um, flow hives that you pull out underneath so that you can see what's in there because I like to look at the condition of row destructor mites and that's where I discovered um, there are other things. Mayfly larvae also feed on row destructor mites down in that tray. They can't exist up in the hive itself. <clears throat> so, and then you look up studies that prove that uh, the pseudoscorpions are feeding on varroa destructor mites, and they did that by dissecting them and discovering that uh, varroa destructor mites are present in the digestive system of the scorpions. That does not show, however, that uh, they got those mites up in the beehive. What it is, is they feed on them like many other things, uh, take advantage of the resources that gather in the bottom of the hive out of reach of the bees. So where else does this exist? This exists in the hive where you've got a screen bottom and things can fall through the screen out of reach of the bees and they collect inside the trays and then things like pseudoscorpions can be down there feeding on the detritus there. And uh, so as far as the other part of the question, sphagnum, moss on the bottom uh, of the hive. <clears throat> if I put any kind of moss or material on the bottom of my beehive, uh, the bees would haul it out of there. Bees don't put up with um, materials just laying around on the bottom of their hive. They're very hygienic, they're clean, they get everything out of there. So that's why, and this holds true when I talk to people like uh, Mr. Ed, uh, which is Jeff Horchaw, and if we talk to Randy McCaffrey, who's Dirt Rooster here on uh, YouTube, and uh, I'm always interested in the condition of the space that they find the bees in, because these people do ripouts, hundreds of ripouts, removals from structures. So the opportunity that we have there, and this holds true when we look at bees in natural cavities as well. So when you look in there, it's remarkable how clean the interior space is of that, where the bees are occupying, where that colony is living. So things that fall to the bottom get removed and dragged out. If they can't be removed and dragged out, like let's say a mouse died down there, the bees have no way to chew a part of mice and remove it. Hornets can, they can carve them up with their little meat cutting mandibles. Wasps can cut things up and remove them bit by bit. Honeybees have a terrible time of doing it, so what do they do? They propolize everything. That's why when we look at the cavity in a bee tree or in buildings, wherever the surface is rough or where the bees can't groom it and remove pieces, they propolize it and seal it up to protect themselves from it. So the same holds true. So if we were to put moss or something like that in the bottom, unless we put it in an area unavailable to the bees, uh, the bees will remove it, get rid of it. So they're letting us know. They don't want it. So there's the answer to that part of it. So anyway, they're not really a meaningful way to fight Varroa destructor mites. They're part of the cleanup crew for things that fall through the cracks literally and end up out of reach of the bees. And so they can chew the mites that fall down there. And maybe there's some, um, you know, help in the fact that that mite can't climb out and get back up with the bees up above, if encounters a pseudoscorpion. So here's the other part of that. And uh, the other part of that is how much can they eat? So if we're talking about, let's look at how many mites there are, how many pseudoscorpions would we need to consume the mites to really put a dent in them? It would be a huge number. <laughs> to to put a fine scientific point on it, there just aren't enough of the pseudoscorpions zipping around in there to take care of it. So that is that. And that's the last question of the day. What else was I going to talk about? So in closing for my fluff section, I'm going to close out this video. I'm going to tag on another video at the end. And I'm going to show you a little 
about uh, carpenter bees. I think that's going to be helpful. So that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed watching. I'm glad that uh, you spent your time here with me. Look for links down below. Don't forget to click a like on the video so you know that you watched it. And uh, the shout out I have not decided on yet. So you're going to have to find out who the shout out was for by looking down in the video description below. So thanks for being with me today. I hope you're having a great Friday and I hope your weekend is excellent too. Thanks for watching. <music>